Well, deemed to be one of the most elaborate and shocking South African prison escapes of our time, the Tabo Besta story continues to unfold like an unending drama series. Ground Up's investigation showed that the Facebook rapist and convicted murderer had escaped from the privately managed Mangaung prison last year, where he was reported to have died. Well, following confirmation by correctional services of his escape, the police have tasked, asked the public rather for help to track the fugitive. And private security company ATD is even offering a reward for any information that can lead to his recapture. But what is the likelihood that he'll be recaptured and what kind of criminal charges would he then face? The University of Limpopo Criminology and Criminal Justice Sehead, Professor Jakub Barkhazen, joins us now to weigh in on that question. Uh, Prof, thank you so much for your time and uh, thank you for joining us this morning. You know, Correctional Services Commissioner Mahoti Tubakhali this week uh, essentially described this prison escape as well calculated and organized. So it does, you know, stand to reason that we're likely to see additional charges come to the fore. Yes, of course. I mean, um, remember, he's a convicted serial raper, rapist and murderer. Serial rapists just don't stop uh, because they're in prison. You know, he escaped. He bribed people, so that's corruption. Mm. Um, he has a fake ID. Well, that's what the news reports. So um, that is violating South Africa identity documents. Laws, popia. Um, if any, if he, if he, if he does anything like murder, right? You know, DCS can be held liable civilly as well as um, uh, GS4, the private uh, prison uh, company that was running Mong. So there's so many charges, um, murder or attempted murder, um, if the prosecutor can prove that the body that was left, that he had something to do with that uh, murder of that person, and they can prove common cause, he can be charged with murder again, or at least uh, abetting murder or assisting after the fact. So there's so many new charges that can come in and will come in when and if they do catch him. Yeah. You know, Prof, you mentioned that, you know, as a, a serial rapist doesn't just go to prison and, you know, become, you know, rehabilitated or reformed by, by spending several years in a prison cell. It's, it takes a lot more work than that, you know. And we know that uh, Tabo Besta started out uh, as a fraudster. His acts of criminality escalated to, to rape and then, of course, to murder. So, I mean, can we expect to see even more brazen acts of criminality now that we know that he is at large and essentially a fugitive? Look, if the reports are true, he was already committing fraud while inside prison, uh, pretending to be somewhere else, hosting, hosting conferences and, and stuff like that. So, of course, the, the, the uh, fraud aspect of his criminal career, he did try to continue while still in a maximum security prison. Um, potentially, there is always a potential that he might commit more violent crimes. Um, if he's smart, he'd stay under the radar, try to uh, leave the country as soon as possible if he didn't already. Um, but again, sometimes uh, people with this type of um, criminal background usually have a, a type of narcissistic personality uh, that they believe they are untouchable and they won't get caught, or they're smarter than the police. Remember, he also taunted the police while he was on the run, uh, while the police was looking, him, looking for him for the serial rapes. So, you know, <clears throat> people with this type of personality usually feel untouchable. So let's hope he doesn't do anything violent, but South Africans should be on the lookout for him and do not approach. You, you don't know, like a, a cornered animal is more dangerous than a, a, a running one. So to, uh, it could potentially lead to more violence.
Yeah. Well, Prof, we know that his romantic partner, Dr. Nandipa Makutumana, um, has been pretty central to, you know, not only the escape, but assisting him to uh, remain out of the police's uh, radar. Uh, we were just going through the newspaper headlines this morning, reading an account of the lengths and the breadths to which she went to to try and retrieve the corpse out of that Hillbrow morgue and essentially get rid of any sort of evidence that can link uh, that piece of um, deceased body back to Tabo Besta. What sort of charges are, is she likely to face? So should she be apprehended by the police as someone who's essentially aided and abetted um, at Tabo Besta? Well, aiding and abetting, helping someone escape from lawful custody, again, common cause um, to, more, to murder or attempted um, murder. It depends on how involved she was with the corpse or with the murder of the person that was the new Tabo Bester aiding and betting fraud. Um, I mean, where did the money come from to pay the bribes? She must have helped move the money. Um, there, again, there's so many charges. There's like um, fraud charges, corruption charges, uh, murder, assisting escape from lawful detention. There's so many charges that you could potentially face. And a good pr prosecutor would probably throw the whole house and the kitchen sink at yeah, yeah. Going back um, to what the Correctional Services Commissioner said in describing um, this prison escape as, you know, being well calculated and, and organized, a lot of the questions that have been asked since the story first broke, Prof, is exactly how deep does the rot of corruption go when it comes to uh, the correctional services uh, industry or, or, or sector, so to speak? You know, it almost sets this idea uh, a blaze, right? That you know, there's a world of criminality, criminality rather, existing within this the system. I mean, what what do you know about exactly how far that rot goes? Look, you have like with any state department, you have good, hard-working people, but there's always this few that uh, rotten apples that spoil the whole barrel. Mm. Now. Just here with Monk Wong, it's a C-max prison. It is a high security prison. The worst of the worst is sent there. Um, like any C-max, there is cameras, there is protocols, there is tighter security than any other um, prison or correctional facility in South Africa. So for this to happen, at a CMAX, at a high security prison, a private prison designed and built for the idea to keep the worst of the worst inside, shows you that there was massive corruption. Um, you don't just drive into uh, a CMAX prison without cameras picking you up. Um, you don't just start a fire at a C-Max prison without people not knowing. Uh, this shows you there is something really rotten in the state of Denmark uh, when, you, when you look at just Meng Huang. So what should be done is a high-level expert panel to investigate all C-Max because we cannot afford um, something like this repeating at other CMAX prisons, uh, like I said, the worst of the worst go there. And now that it's sort of one guy has done it, uh, a lot of other uh, offenders would think, well, if he can do it, let me try as well. And that, that is something we really can't afford in South Africa. Right? Yeah. I mean, what you're mentioning there about taking a closer look at what's happened here is so true. But I think for South Africans, you know, the brazen nature of this particular incident has left us, you know, gobsmacked, but also forces us to pose the question, how often um, do incidents like these occur? How many times or how often do we have prisoners escaping from, um, you know, maximum security facilities? I mean, I was trying to find out some information myself and 
you know, in, in the 2021-2022 financial year, 22 uh, inmates managed to uh, escape while a, a, a staggering 117 prisoners broke out from prisons the year before. So we've seen um, an impressive decline in prison escapes over the years. But clearly this is something that's still happening. It's not making it into mainstream media unless it's of the sort of uh, grandiose uh, nature that we're seeing right now. Yeah, that's true. It, it seems to be going down. But remember, is it actually being reported? Look how long it took for the Starbuck Bester story to actually be confirmed. So it was 2022 when he escaped. It is now 2023. So will Starbuck Bester's escape be part of the 2022 stats or will it be part of the 2023 stats? You understand what I'm trying to say? Can we really trust the stats? Um, and then also, it's such an embarrassment when prisoners, offenders escape from correction facility. And it's so dangerous. And as we see now, uh, GS4 still denied that person escaped, even with all the scientific evidence there. So there could be more escapes, but it's not reported. And the reason for not reporting, first of all, it's embarrassing for the departments, the companies. Um, it shows a deep-seated art uh, in certain areas. And, uh, um, uh, and then the other uh, excuse would be um, it's, it's not reported so that it doesn't cause panic among the populace, which is sort of defeating the whole idea of letting people know they might be in danger. Yeah. Well, the story is out, of course, and it has grabbed all of our attention. Um, what would be the major takeaways, uh, if, if, if I could phrase it that way, that we could potentially learn from this particular um, um, incident? You've already mentioned that certainly it drives up the call for some sort of you know, independent inquiry or investigation into the happenings um, at these maximum security facilities, but perhaps an even deeper uh, inquiry into you know, correctional services as a whole. I'm thinking about you know, Busasa his own sort of contributions to, you know, state capture and, and how government officials were involved there. So we know that there is certainly a rot within that particular department. How far it goes, how deep it is, how wide it is, are perhaps some of the questions that we still need to be, uh, we still need answered. Yes, that is correct. Look, there has to be a massive investigation and an independent, expert-driven investigation on what happened, what went wrong, what is going on actually at DCS. And um, but not just DCS. Remember, this is, this is not just on State Department that this affects. It affects police. It affects justice, the NPA. It should be a fully independent panel that looks at exactly what went wrong, how much money was moved and how many people were involved, bribed, looked the other way or um, and who didn't think this was something to be reported. And just to end off on that, you know, we're all talking about Tabu Bester and who it's brazen escape. But remember, he was in CMAX for a reason. Um, we don't talk about his victims. I mean, there's victims that's probably now because of this news story, because of what's going on, living in fear. Remember, he was a convicted serial rapist and murderer. Can you imagine how you would feel if you were his victim and you wake up one morning and it's on the news, the guy you thought was in prison for 50 years is suddenly out and has escaped. The fear that that would cause in the victims is something that DCS should also be held responsible. I mean, you expect that justice was served. You will be safe from this person for the next 50 years or until um, he goes in front of the court. And then you wake up one morning and eventually DCS confirms, oh, yeah, the guy escaped. So, you know, we, we need to be cognizant of these victims currently as well.
Indeed, Prof. There are so many uh, elements to the story that we absolutely need to pay uh, greater attention to. And thank you so much for sharing those insights with us this morning. That's University of Limpopo Criminology and uh, Criminal Justice Head, Professor Yaku uh, Barkhazen.